before we get started with today's episode, I want to make sure and thank our sponsors, Alert Communications, Law Clerk, Clio, and Abby Connect. So if I was starting today as a new solo, I would do something like, You have to communicate that and figure out your plan. I wish that they'd done it earlier. Do that by organizing what it means to be fulfilled and becoming a leader in your law firm's new approach. New tools, new mindset, new solo. And it's making that leap, making that leap, making that leap, making that leap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of New Solo on Legal Talk Network. I'm Adriana Linares. I'm a legal technology trainer and consultant. I help lawyers and law firms use technology better. My guest today, which I'm pretty excited about because this is a topic everyone's going to love, is Peggy Grenke. And Peggy is an accounting and finance expert for lawyers. Hey, Peggy. Hi, Adrian. Thank you for inviting me on, on your show today. Well, it's a topic that I feel like I don't cover enough, and it's really important, so I thank you for your time. Before I dig in too deep into the conversation, I want you to not only tell everyone a little bit about yourself and your practice and what you do and how you help lawyers, but I also want you to spell your last name in case somebody wants to Google you <laughs> after hearing this. They know how. Awesome. So the last name is G-R-U-E-N-K-E. So it's German, but we have bastardized it to be American. Um, so it's grunky and not grunky. So thank you for that. Yes, my background is um, I've actually been in the legal world for about 22 years. I started as an IT consultant. That was my first career. Mm -hmm. And then I got into the world of bar associations. I was director at a bar association, which led me down the path eventually of managing law firms. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So I managed a couple of mid-sized law firms and, and so what was which was really great was I got a little flavor of other law practice management softwares that were out there sure. before the onset ten years ago of all the cloud based applications like Clio and in my case, of Practice Panther and all of those. But my business, CPN Legal, really took off about seven years ago when I kept getting a a lot of calls from solo lawyers to help them set up their virtual law practices, get them started with software on them. What else do I need? Really kind of mentoring them. I work, I yeah. did a lot at the since I law school mentoring um, and really teaching the business side of the law stuff that they don't hear a lot about. And then about seven years ago, when I started CPN Legal, my husband, who's always has been an outsourced CFO type person, was uh, brought into the business of the legal side. So we've been a team since family then. Business. And we now, you know, family business. And now we have nine employees. So there's 11 of us here in Cincinnati. And we love what we do for lawyers. And you work nationally. And one of the things that I love about what you do is, and I don't know, this might be a little early in the conversation, but I just want to say it is you help us move from old, what you mentioned earlier, which was pre-cloud practice management programs. I like to call those traditional practice management programs yeah. versus modern. And one of the things you're good at doing is, is that transition plus then really helping with the accounting side. And I mean specifically helping to move data from a and give me an example. Why don't I let you give the example? Because I feel like we're all always looking for this. If I'm coming off of Abacus and I want to move to yes. Clio, now Clio will do a lot of the data migration themselves, but then getting it over to a QuickBooks or something like that is, is, is part of your expertise as well. Yeah, that's definitely our sweet spot right now. And there's a lot of that those conversions going on right mm -hmm. now. I blame it on COVID, but we'll we'll take it. So yeah, so what we what we tell lawyers is that when you're converting from what I call a traditional server based system, mm -hmm. which is you know or enterprise based system, is while, while the Clios of the world can bring over your law practice management data as far as contacts and matters and and time entries and notes on the financial side of it. When we're, this is really important to distinguish, too, because you can't bring into QuickBooks all your previous year's worth of financial data. It's just not, you just can't do it. And I just want to fill in a blank hole here just to, to make sure this is clear. And especially the listeners who've never used traditional practice management program, oh, yeah. it's the old genie that's popped out of the bottle, which is this. The traditional practice management programs would do everything for law firms, including the accounting and the bookkeeping and writing checks and managing ledgers. In today's more modern world, those programs are a little harder to find. They're not impossible. Zola, Cosmolex, Action Step, and Step. Centerbase. And so Solona. 
And Saluna, Saluna, Saluna yeah. do that. But very popular programs like Clio and Rocket Matter, they leave the accounting to QuickBooks. So what you're saying is if you're going to come from a traditional practice management program that had everything baked into one, now you've got to move that data out or at least not move it, but transition to a new way of doing it, which would be into QuickBooks because it's easy to take out calendaring, contacts, names, addresses, and put that into Clio. But now the problem, and this is where your expertise is, which I always turn to you when I have these clients, is what do we do with the financial data that's either historical and then either keep it somewhere or on an ongoing basis? Did I get that right? You did get that right, yeah. Okay. And, and this is really a good time frame to be talking about this because we're in the first quarter of the year and, it, and you know, as we have a lot of this stuff going on right now. What we basically do is we rebuild the current year inside of QuickBooks Online. Okay, so we're going to take all of your data as of 2021. 2021 is going to become your financial center moving forward. And we don't want to file taxes having financial information in two programs. So we bring it all over. We rebuild the year in QuickBooks Online. And it sounds very overwhelming. And it's it's not. It's it's really quite simple to do. I say that because we do it all the time. Right. But, <laughs> and then the important piece is, is, is at the end of 2020, when you filed your taxes and submitted your final balance sheet and your P&L statement to your tax person, we have to take what's called those ending balances and we move them over to QuickBooks as starting balances so that all your financials match from the year end of 2020 to 2021. Even though it's two separate programs, you make them yes. match, right? We make Got them it. match. And then and then we always advise people, most people that are coming, Adriana, from those historical server-based systems are still going to own that software on mm -hmm. their server. So you're still going to have access to that financial data. Just make sure it's backed up. What you do lose, and I know it's kind of a shame, is you lose the ability to do like a previous year comparison. Yeah. Okay. Now we have... We have done things for, for bigger law firms that actually want to maintain that previous year comparison. And we have a unique way of bringing in the prior year data into QuickBooks so that they have that flexibility. It's just it's just a digging a little bit deeper into what we can do for them. It just means it's going to cost them more money, but it's probably worth it if they want it. But at least it's exactly. doable. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. And I think, you know, a lot of times what I will recommend you just said, you know, that you, you're going to hold on to that data. You're probably still going to have the server or the workstation that the information was on. What I tell law firms to do after we've taken all that information out of there is air gap it, meaning that server, if it has no other purpose than being there for legacy and historical purposes, you disconnect it from the internet to prevent a possible hack or ransomware attack. It can sit there till that hard drive dies just running, but it doesn't need to be connected to the internet if it has no other purpose. And that's just, I think that creates a safety net for them to be able to go back and look at that data, but a double safety net because it's not connected to the internet, but at least the information's there if you need to go back. Yeah. Yeah. So I, the other thing that was been on my mind when we first started talking about me being on the show and you're at, you know, well, who, when they come to us, what are their burning questions about yeah. finance and accounting needs? Right. And I have to say 2020 was a very unique year and, and you'll, you'll all, your listeners will, will probably understand this because they may have <laughs> lived this. Um, it was the PPP loans. Sure. So now it's March. Now all this money is available. But what we found were people were not prepared to apply for a PP loan because they didn't have good financials. Mm. They couldn't even put together a P&L. They couldn't even provide the data to submit the P&L because they didn't have they didn't have their QuickBooks reconciled. It was a mess. You know, things were all over the place. So really, it, it was a, a unique year for us in that we were helping a lot of solo lawyers out there with small firms who needed this money to get their QuickBooks, what we call cleaned up sure. and up to date so that they could actually produce the proper reports, getting the payroll data properly record, you know, out of their, out of their payroll system, getting their you know, P&L statements out of their QuickBooks. So that really was a really aha moment for us when the phone kept ringing so much. And I was like, well, this is why. So when I'm talking to new solos, getting them set up, I'm kind of using that as a learning yeah. experience for them because they're like, do I really need to get QuickBooks? Do I yes. really? I'm like, yes, you do. Yes, you, don't you know do. What <laughs> you don't know what emergencies down the road from you that you're going to need this. And COVID was the perfect storm, right? 
That's great. So the lesson here is a lot of times we're a little loosey goosey with our financials because maybe you are a solo or you're just a solo and an assistant or a parallel, you know, you're very, a, my, what I jokingly refer to as micro law firms, right? So there's what we call large, medium, small. And then for me, I call a micro law firm really when it's a solo plus one yeah. or two. Um, so the lesson is it's really important that the business health and the financial health of your law firm is set regardless of of what you think may or may not happen and lessons learned, disasters can be avoided, or at least we can ease the dealing of a disaster by making sure that you have your financials right. Yeah. right. So let me ask you this, Peggy. When a new solo or new lawyer or, or a lawyer who's leaving a big firm going on his own says, where do I start? What do I need? I start with five very basic things that they need. So I'm going to rattle them off to you. And then you tell me either what you add on or, and then I have, I do have a follow-up question to my own response, which is going to be, I always say, look, you have to have Office 365. You have to have Adobe Acrobat DC. You have to have a practice management program. You have to have a good way of managing documents and emails. And that might be the same as a practice management program. And you have to have QuickBooks. <laughs> <laughs> I, then someone I like will- list. Someone will say to me, well, what about FreshBooks or Kahuna? So I want you to respond so that when somebody says to me, what about FreshBooks? Um, wait, Kahuna, they don't, they use zero. They don't. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's zero that I'm thinking of. So Kahuna is a company that specializes in helping lawyers and law firms, but they use zero. So what I say is please go with QuickBooks. It's the most ubiquitous. If you find a bookkeeper and or you have to get a new one or yours retires yeah. or something, you've really got to go with the the... That's my advice. What's yours? So I, I I love your list, but but my list starts before your list. Oh, good. okay. Sure. Yeah. So new lawyers starting out, there's certain things that they have to do. So we're big on checklists. So, you know, we run everything through checklists, right? So first of all, you need to get an EIN number. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Let's start yeah. with the super okay. basics. Yeah. Super, good. super basics, because this this surprises you when they come to us. It's like, oh. Do you have your bank account set up yet? So you okay, need a so banking get, relationship. Yeah, get your EIN number, which you need before you can create a bank account. Get your bank account number set up. Determine how you're going to be incorporated. You know, how how which are you going to be a partnership? Are you going to be an LLC? That's going to be an S corp because that will determine if you can do payroll through the business. Okay, so ch that choice of entity is important for setting up your business. Then after we get that set up, then we choose our accounting software. Okay. And now we're ready to launch into that. And I always actually suggest that they choose their accounting software in parallel with their law practice management software, because those sure. two are going to have to talk together. All right. Yeah. Now, wait, it's no let me emphasize yeah. that. We want your practice management program to talk to your accounting and financial programs. You should yes. not be doing double entry. And this day and age, nobody should be doing double entry because things talk to each other. Exactly. Okay. And go. some talk and, and some talk better. Yeah. To each other. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, please please so, don't involve Zapier in this. Please. No, no, no zaps, please. <laughs> right. Zaps are not good when it comes to sending financial data back and forth. So you need to pick your law practice management software that has a solid foundation, a good integration with QuickBooks Online that's reliable and doesn't break, and has the flexibility to, to bring over the data in a different but they call it mapping mapping mm -hmm. the fields over. Okay. So we build up, we build the mapping correctly. We're Clio. We work mostly with Clio. Um, I do have Practice Panther in my case clients as well, but I am uh, have an experience with multiple ones. Clio hands down has the best QuickBooks integration there is out there. I mean, you just can't. And, and we get the privilege of being on their development team and helping develop in the ne next Excellent. new features and test Great. them. So we know what's coming up and we know what they're working on and constant improvement. So choosing their law practice management software is important and always choose QuickBooks. <laughs> so just, to your oh, point. Thank just, God, just like, please just always choose QuickBooks. Do not let some rogue yeah. consultant or, and I don't mean legal consultant because most of them would not push you in a different direction, but you know, so an advisor push you to anything else. Okay, good. Settled. Check. Yeah, Check it, QuickBooks on, and, and what and that becomes important because law as a solo starts out, and when I help on board a lot of solos, and I'm happy to teach them the basics and get them going because I want them to learn their business. I want them to understand some stuff as they build their business. But knowing that they're going to be too busy at some point in time to do this 
accounting work or this bookkeeping work or however you want to label it. So when they're ready to reach out to somebody to help them, the options for finding somebody that knows mm-hmm. fresh books and zero, zero is probably a unique one, but not many people, you know, you have many options, but they also have to know law firms. So I right. think the biggest, and one of the things, one of the questions we had prepped about talking about, and I don't know if it makes sense to go into this right now or not, but um, what are we seeing when we're taking over bookkeeping work for clients? Like what kind of messes are we getting into? So the types of messes we have are bookkeepers that don't have any idea how to do law firm accounting. They're booking trust account transactions to fee income. They're booking expenses in the trust account to true expenses on the P&L. There's so much stuff going on. So when you're choosing that bookkeeper, QuickBooks is a great product, works with Clio, and you want somebody that understands law firm businesses. Can I just say one of the biggest things I used to hear, I feel like I hear it a little bit less and less, is QuickBooks doesn't work for lawyers and law firms. And I would always say, I know, you're so special, you snowflakes, you. (laughs) Or maybe you just don't have someone who understands how QuickBooks can work for lawyers and law firms. So are you pretty much saying QuickBooks will work? You just have to have it set up right, and you have to have somebody who knows what they're doing in a legal environment. Correct. QuickBooks is the number one accounting software in the world for small businesses for a reason. Okay? Yeah. It's like somebody trying to tell me Word doesn't work for them. I mean- (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like it works. So the the key to that working though, Adriana, and it goes into a lot of things is understanding the foundation of any accounting system is what's called your chart of accounts. Okay. You have to build out your chart of accounts to fit your business. So we, we have a basic chart of accounts that we use for all of our solo small firm lawyers that we upload into QuickBooks and then they're ready to go to work. Excellent. You know, and, it, and it's ready to go, and everything's there to handle the trust accounting, to handle the integrations with, with the Clio softwares of the world, and to properly track your income, your cost of goods sold, your client advanced costs, and all your expenses. That's great. This sounds just like a good place to stop for just a few minutes, listen to some messages from some sponsors. We'll come back and finish this conversation. It's been very enlightening so far. Great. We'll be right back. Law Clerk is where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Whether you need a research memo or a complicated appellate brief, our network of freelance lawyers have every level of experience and expertise. Signing up is free and there are no monthly fees. Only pay the flat fee price you set. Use rebate code NEWSOLO to get a $100 Amazon gift card when you complete your next project. Learn more at lawclerk.legal. As the largest legal-only call center in the U.S., Alert Communications helps law firms and legal marketing agencies with new client intake. Alert captures and responds to all leads 24-7, 365 as an extension of your firm in both English and Spanish. Alert uses proven intake methods, customizing responses as needed, which earns the trust of clients and improves client retention. To find out how Alert can help your law office, call 866-827-5568 or visit alertcommunications.com forward slash LTN. Okay, everyone, if you listened last month, we introduced a new segment called New Insights, where a newish attorney asks an experienced attorney some questions. And I want to make sure and thank Noda, powered by M&T Bank for their support of this segment. To learn more, please visit TrustNoda, and OTA so it's TrustNoda.com. Terms and conditions may apply. We're going to hear Robert's second question posed to Eric Ganchi. All right, Robert, let's hear it. Question number two for Eric. So I'm just wondering, as far as trial prep specifically, what are some of those recommended practice manuals, reference materials that are just kind of gold I know I am Winkle Reed is a great one for evidence. Do you have any other suggestions for for new attorneys looking to move up the learning curve? So there's a few things to think about with what books that you want to have on your counsel table at trial. Books that can be very helpful are going to be books about evidence, books about criminal procedure or civil procedure. If you're in California, CEB has some really wonderful procedural books to go by. But if you're in different states and that you may have good secondary resources for that or not. In general, this is what I recommend is start off with going to the law library. And it's not so much what books do you need to have like right away. It's more about 
finding out what books that you will find out that you need to have right away. Because when I first started doing trials, man, I would bring in like so, like car, like just wagons full of books. I don't, not a wagon, like a not like a radio flyer. <laughs> um, but it would just be like a lot of books and I would be carting all the stuff around and then you set it up all on your table and then at the end of the day, you got to like cart it all out if they need to be use the courtroom for something else. And it's just a lot of stuff to be lugging around. Although a lot of books they, they make digitally now, which makes things so much easier. If you go to the library and if you check out what books they have on trial stuff, and then you'll see what books that you're starting to have, that you're starting to use over and over and over again. And then if there's some books that you're like, I have to have this, or I'm at the library every single day, then maybe you invest in that. But there's things to consider about what books to have because books are pricey. And then you have to update the books, either buying the entire new book series when it comes out, usually on an annual basis, or if they send you updates, you have to pay for the updates for it. So it just, it turns into a lot of legwork, which if you have a good public law library system, they love it when you use the resources. So I would recommend starting with that. Outside of that, it's not uncommon at all to have a really weird issue come up at trial. So whatever the practice area is for the trial that you're doing and whatever secondary source you have become comfortable with, then you may want to keep that stuff handy either you know, at, at council table if you want to have it at council table with you or just keep it in your car if you're you know, driving to court. That way you can like pop out and like look at it in your car when you're on a break or something. Because it happened quite a bit where it would be a, a really weird issue that would come up. And then on the other side of the V, at the prosecutors, they would have like tons of ability to like look stuff up through like Westlaw and stuff. And they had access to the internet and all these kind of things. And I had none of that. So, you know, sometimes it would be beneficial to have some ability to look stuff up. It's more of a question of not so much what do you want to have for trial. It's more of what books do you find that you use always? And so the books on criminal or civil procedure and evidence, those are going to be really main ones. And then any books that are just in line with whatever practice area that your trial is. I hope you all are enjoying new insights as much as I am. I got some feedback from Robert on Eric's first answers to his questions. He was so grateful for his time and expertise, and I want to do the same. Thank them both for their time. And now we're just going to listen to a couple messages from some sponsors. Your legal work requires your full attention. So how can you answer all the phone calls from newer existing clients while juggling your caseload? Try Abby Connect, the friendly, industry-trained live receptionist who are well-known for consistently providing high-quality customer service, lead intake, and appointment setting to firms just like yours. Visit abby.com forward slash LTN or call 833-ABBY-WOW for your free 14-day trial and $95 off your first bill. Did you know that firms using electronic payments collect an average of $15,179 more per lawyer and see 6% more revenue growth? Simply put, law firms using electronic payments on average bring in higher case volumes and more revenue. For more insights to help turbocharge your law firm, check out Clio's Legal Trends Report, a compilation of industry insights. Go to clio.com to download your free copy today. All right, everyone, we're back, and I'm here with Peggy Grinke. Peggy is a financial expert in the world of legal technology, and when I get new lawyers and law firms that are looking for help with bookkeeping, accounting, finance, how to get QuickBooks to talk to their practice management programs, I help up to a certain point, and now I'm just sending them to Peggy because I don't do accounting, and I'm happy not to. It would be a mess if I tried to help, and I really like referring experts. Peggy, I meant to ask you before I dive back in, do you all do month-to-month bookkeeping for lawyers, or are you more just part of the the process of getting them onboarded and set up, and then you let them fly? We do both. We go through the onboarding process, and then uh, the the real heart of our business is the monthly ongoing bookkeeping and producing of financial reports. We deliver a package every month go over it with them. We do a lot of cash flow reports. This is a big item lately for solos, and we can get into that later, but really understanding where their business is at. Excellent. So I want to double back for just a second and ask you about the messes. So you you said, you know, we clean up a lot of messes and last year was a lot of mess up cleanup. Yeah. Um, you mentioned just not having the accounting either updated. I bet you encounter people that just don't even have QuickBooks at some point, right? Like 
They just hadn't gotten to that point yet. And then um, we mentioned that sometimes the bookkeeper isn't very knowledgeable about how law firms' books need to be kept. What other messes can you tell us about that we want to avoid and not come to you with? The biggest mess we see is people's trust accounts. And it's really sad because this is the one that has your law law license on the line. Right. And we're in the process now of, of cleaning up a few of these messes. And what we see is, you know, and to your listeners, I don't know how deep we want to get into this, but your your trust bank account is really a liability. That's where your liabilities sit. So on your balance sheet, you have assets and you have liabilities. Your biggest liability that you're holding on to is other people's monies. And anything that happens in that trust bank account cannot hit an income account. It cannot hit an expense account. Those are your things that are reserved account. for a P&L. Operating, yeah. Those things only hit what's called a liability account. And what we see when we're, we look at a trust bank account is we're looking at these transactions and we see things booked to bank fees. That's a big one. Oh. Or, you know, they order checks and they charge the checks to the trust account. You can't do that kind of stuff. Everything has to stay within a liability account inside that. So we have to go back. A lot of things hit it. They're doing transfers. So when they transfer funds, so you do, do your billing. You know, we're doing our billing and we do a lot with billing for, for lawyers too, mm-hmm. by the way. And you're ready to transfer your trust monies in your law practice management software has taken care of applying them to your invoices. But on the accounting side of it, in your books, you still have to move that money from the trust account to the operating account, right? Well, we see a lot of people doing that incorrectly and which causes trouble with what we call as a three-way match reconciliation report. So when we take on a new client and we notice the mistakes in the trust account, the first thing we do is prepare what's called a three-way match reconciliation report, which is a unique, it's not unique, but I think our process is a bit, a little bit unique because we're going to identify the errors right away and fix them before we get too farther down the path with them. And a lot of the times right now, we have to go back and clean up 2020 because they've over-recorded income, right? Mm-hmm. So they're, they're going to be paying taxes on things that were recorded incorrectly because their bookkeeper didn't know how to do them. So that, that's a big mess that we clean, we clean up, unfortunately. <laughs> the other thing that we see a lot of is understanding client advance costs. Now, this is, a, this is important for you guys because they're, you're paying up front for these expenses, and you need to make sure that you're getting reimbursed for these later down the road. So how you're recording them on your in your in your QuickBooks is important to have your chart of accounts set up correctly to capture those as expenses. We actually call them cost of goods sold. And this is a new terminology that, speaking of the PPP loans, yeah. the PPP loan application, they all have what's your cost of goods sold. We don't, don't sell goods. <laughs> It's like what you do, it's called client advanced expenses. So being a way to properly see that monthly on your P&L statements, the monies that you put out for client expenses, and separately, the money that came in to reimburse yourself. So we call that recovered income, recovered expense income. So we see a lot of people confused about that when we take them on board. And so we just really clean up their chart of accounts so they can have a better visual picture of all those transactions. The other thing that we see a big issue with is AR. A lot, a lot of big AR out there that, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth that just needs to get off the books. I saw, I was helping a firm a couple of weeks ago and we were looking at their old data and he said, there's $120,000 of unpaid bills in here. You know, he was surprised. And I thought, I can tell you right now, if a client owes me $1, because I, first of all, I, not a lawyer. I have a simple, different business, but I can tell. I said you've got a hundred and twenty thousand unpaid dollars. That's a whole yeah. salary for someone. How is this possible? But it happens. It's 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 exact. That's that's a great way of putting it, right? Or it's it's tuition for your kids' yeah. college for the, you know whatever. Oh my but, God! And how um, are you going to go back now and get it? Some of the that AR that we were looking at was eight, nine, ten years old. I thought, well, yeah. it was, <laughs> bye. Yeah. You can't. And there's no such thing as bad debt on a P&L statement for lawyers, by the way. They're cash-based systems. So you only are realizing the income when you receive it. But anyway, so so getting a better handle on preventing these AR issues ahead of time, but also just getting rid of the AR issues that are out there. And we, we say, let's start with a clean slate. Lessons learned. What are we going right. to change to make sure that this doesn't happen again? And our, our 
my art, my personal belief is it all starts with the fee agreement letter. Because in that fee agreement letter, that's where you have to identify financial obligations and be really crystal clear with your attorney what your expectations are. You know, are you taking retainers? You know, does a client understand what a trust account is? They, mm-hmm. you, you use these terminologies that they really don't understand. But that's one of my big pet peeves is people that don't have good fee agreements with the ability to do that. Do you suggest that they add a glossary? of sorts to the fee agreement? I mean, sounds silly, but that's totally something I would do. I'd add an appendix with a glossary that explains what those things are, unless we're going to talk about it over the phone during a consultation. Well, you always talk about it in person. That's the other, that's a great point because you can't rely on them reading that fee agreement. They're going to glance over those financial obligations in in your terms and your retainers that you're requesting. And I'll tell you what we're seeing a big onslaught of lately is evergreen retainers, Adriana. A big what does that push. mean? That means that you set up an arrangement in your fee agreement that a client is required to keep a minimum trust balance of $1,000. And as soon as that trust balance falls below a minimum, they have to replenish that trust back up to that minimum so that you In order for you to keep working on their matter. Exactly. Exactly. I always tell lawyers, I mean, like when when you go to the doctors, you go to the dentist, they want payment upon receipt, right? You, You guys are not in the business of loaning money to people. Okay, you're in the business of being a lawyer and that expectation has to be set. But we're really seeing a lot of success from a cash flow perspective with our solos that we're setting up on these evergreen retainers. And with credit and with taking the credit card payments too. Right. Well, that's in a whole nother conversation. I still have a lot of lawyers that don't take credit card payments. The other thing, other issues we see coming, you're asking about issues we see. Yeah, more unpredict- messes. Give us the messes. More messes, <laughs> messes is, is inconsistent revenue. Okay. We're looking at them. They come to them. And this is a different type of mess. It's not a mess because their books are messed up. It's a mess because they haven't c- gotten good habits into their billing systems. So we're seeing, you know, we can't project future revenue if we don't have a good billing process in place to help them decide, you know, how how much money do you need to cover your next six weeks of expenses, mm. all right? So we know what your six weeks of expenses are because we built what's called your monthly nut. So we know what you need to come into, but what we don't know is your monthly revenue because you, you're not tracking your, your work in progress properly, you're not getting your time entered, and you just aren't getting your bills out on a regular basis. So we have switched a number of our solos, from particular small ones, to, to bi-weekly billing. So they're actually invoicing twice a month. I think that's great. For people listening out there, if you want a nice profitable little business, you invoice twice a month. And then what happens is you're training your clients to expect that, mm-hmm. right? And you're getting built, you're communicating with them more frequently, Right. And they like that's always that. another co- a complaint I get sure, is that they never course. hear from their lawyer. So there's a lot of good things that happen to buy because of biweekly billing. And one of which is that you get paid more frequently. Is this a good time for me to just make a case for practice management programs? So I'm thinking about Clio because like you, I favor Clio. I, I, I know there's a lot of other good products out there. So I'm going to just mention Clio does these things, but I will also assume that a good practice management program does them too. One of those is um, I know that Clio will remind the users inside of a firm when a retainer has dropped. So if you are going to work on evergreen retainer, you don't have to sit there looking at all your matters to see where it's dropped. Clio will send a reminder when it has dropped to a certain amount. Is that right? It is right. And okay. there's also a great report out there, Adrian, called the Matter Balance, the Trust Replenishment Report. Trust, oh, great. Trust yeah. Management Report. So we run that right before we're going to do a billing, or right after a billing cycle. So in one report, we have a report that shows us everyone that's below their minimum balance. So right after sending out invoices, we turn right around and prepare their, inside of Clio, your trust request invoices Excellent. and get those out too. Yeah. And two, you mentioned, you know, that, you know, the work in progress isn't being tracked, bills aren't going out. And yet again, ways that you can get helped by technology in doing all that is by having a practice management program. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that. Obviously, a lot of lawyers still think I'm just a solo. I don't need a practice management program. 
that makes me crazy. So if you're struggling with these things and you haven't gotten a practice management program, it's really important that you do. And if you do have a practice management program and you're still struggling, it's important for you to get help in, in, in getting to the point where, where these aren't issues anymore. And I think the next topic, Peggy, is kind of exactly where you were, which is reports. It's important to get reports and look at reports. And I also want to go back real quick and remind our listeners that there's another good episode we did about a year ago, maybe a little bit more. So you can Google or go back through the list, but it's a long list, but look for new solo podcast, then put in the name Amanda Moore. I had Amanda, Mandy Moore come on a while ago and give us the money management 101 for solo small firm professionals. So she's a CPA and she came and gave us a lot of the basics that will help you understand and better process what Peggy is saying. So it's just a good supporting episode to go back and listen to. Okay, Peggy, we were talking about reports. Yes. So we have two places we can get reports. Out of your QuickBooks program is going to be what your financial reports are going to be that you're going to need for your taxes at the end of the year as well. But it's also the reports that kind of give you a history, a, a sto- tell the story of your business. So we have two types of reports in QuickBooks. One's called a balance sheet report, which is probably the most boring one. But there's important stuff on there. And when you run a balance sheet, you always want to compare it to the previous period so you can see the change. All right. So remember, your balance sheet lists all your assets, which is all your bank accounts, and then all your liabilities. So on the bank account side, you might you might see at the end of January you had you had twenty thousand you have twenty thousand dollars in your bank account, but at the end of December you had one hundred fifty thousand. So that's a big jump. So yeah. we want to we want to visually be able to see these changes that happen. And on that balance sheet, the other reason that report is utmost importance is it be, it's because your your trust bank account, which is on your your balance sheet, has to tie to your your trust liability account number. Those yeah. numbers ha- have to match. And the third leg of that is the data. I right? said so you get data from two places. Uh-huh. The third leg to that three-way match is in Clio or in your law practice management software where you have your client ledger balances. So you kind of want to look at your balance sheet. You kind of want to look at your owner draws, how much money you're taking out of the business. And that's all part of the balance sheet. The profit and loss report is going to be the one that if you design a good chart of accounts, it's really going to lay out all your expenses. And we like we like doing those in what we call a format called rolling 12 months. So you always have a whole full 12-month view. And you can visually see for each category, rent or software mm-hmm. or, or remote receptionist, what those amounts are each month and what has jumped up. So it'll really point out, my God, why did supplies, what what went with supplies? They went up $2,000 this month. Right. So looking why? at that mm-hmm. that information and really deciphering it and, and understanding what's on those reports is helpful, which is why we are really animate about designing that chart of accounts to tell you the story that you need need to hear. The other set of reports that we get out of, out of the Clio software part of it is a lot of lawyers want to know fee income by practice area and things like that. So we can take those reports out of Clio. Let's, let's use an example, uh, the revenue report by practice area. And we can take that breakdown and put that into QuickBooks. So now their P&L statement will take their revenue number and break it out by practice area. So it's not all at what we call a top level. One number. lump sum. Yeah. So this allows you to see where your most profitable areas of law are. Maybe you decided to do real estate and estate planning and litigation. And then it turns out that litigation costs you a lot more money than it makes you. And maybe it's better for you to eliminate that part of your practice. You're going to have a more profitable business if you focus on these two areas or vice versa. You might look and say, wow, litigation sure is a cash cow. We should focus on that. Is that yeah. one of the reasons you really want the, that type of information? Yeah, we, and you want to see the historical trend because you want to really see what you know where where you're spending most of your time, and yeah. that actually kind of couples with the whole idea of tracking your billable time, you know, tracking yeah. your hours, getting them. We, we talk about a, a, a profitable law firm has a funnel. Okay, the top of that funnel is your time. All right, and and are you being efficient with getting your your using your eight hour day? And getting it all recorded on, on a client's bill so that it can eventually be be paid to you and you can make the money that you started this business for, right? So, so What do you yeah. say to attorneys who say, I do contingency or flat fee work. I don't need to track my hours. 
Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, um, you still need one. to track your hours. Still need um, to track those hours. <laughs> okay, and that's a good point because um, one of the things that we see with people that do a lot of flat fee work is a very inconsistent revenue workflow, mm-hmm. okay? You've got to balance that with hourly and flat fee. I mean, everybody loves this whole flat fee concept, but until you really know how profitable your flat, you'll be shocked. We've done I flat agree. fee analysis for lawyers. In that, By the way, that means you have to actually put your hour in Clio, but Clio makes it really, really easy to do this. You can you know, create your flat fee matter. You can record all your time entries. And then when that case is finalized, we can pull the report for you real quickly and tell you exactly what the expense, the fee expenses and, and real expenses were on that case that you charged a $1,500 flat fee for may have actually ended up costing you $2,500. And that's God. just, and that's not even the personnel. I could go on like this forever because I get really <laughs> excited. But that's not even, that's not even your personnel cost. Okay. No. And, and right. your admin cost and everything else that goes into doing something. So it's interesting. But yeah, so so contingency cases, flat fee are the ones I'm really more adamant about, about making sure you record your time. Contingency cases more because you may have to actually submit it to, to the judge Right. To get to get your fees. A lot of probate work is this way type thing. And they do you, track their hours too because yeah. of that, I know. Yeah. Well, I think this is all such good advice and I really hope listeners heed our our your warnings and advice and, and really pay attention. Um, maybe take some time and get set up right. Look for those reports, get some help if you need it. But Peggy, I know one of the questions that you answer a lot and very well, especially helping solos and smalls, I think you're doing a presentation for the San Diego County Bar Association for me on this very topic. And that is, how do I make money? Like what are the secrets to profitability in a law firm? We have a formula for that. And and we have a, we have a spreadsheet. So my, my advice here is, is that you have to first start with identifying how much do you need to make? How much is a lawyer? Why did you go into this business? What do you need to support your family? So what, how much salary are you going to need to take out of the business? Right. And so write that on a piece of paper. How many, how, what's your expenses? What are your monthly expenses going to be? And we call that your monthly nut. So that's anywhere from software to, to, to rent, to, to supplies, to virtual assistants, to contractors, you name it, but you need to write all this stuff out in a very, Word ca- cautious word here is please avoid shiny objects. <laughs> all right. Because those shiny objects add up really, really quickly. So we got your salary at the top, because we always want to think of you first. We've got your expenses at the bottom. We have your number. Okay. Now that that number, maybe that number is $150,000. So it's, law firms are the simplest businesses in the world, you guys. And we try to make it so complicated. The hardest part is getting business. So get your business, then you do the work, and then you bill your clients and you get paid. And if you've done everything well up through that, this whole process, the getting paid part should be really simple. But here's how you make the money. You figure out what you need. Your $150,000 is your break-even point. Now you go back into that and you say, well, if I'm going to bill $1,000 a month at $250 a thousand dollars, a thousand hours, sorry, um, <laughs> um, a year at two hundred and fifty dollars an hour. That's two hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? But we all know that that doesn't always come out in the end because we have things like billing realizations and collection realization rates, which affect that bottom number. Um, which is a whole other topic, Adriana, that I don't have time for. I'll but, have to have you come back. <laughs> so anyway, my point is. is to find out how profitable you're going to be and how much you can actually make. It's a simple business. Don't complicate it. Do the right things up front and everything should flow through to the bottom line. Well, that's great. Peggy, I can't thank you enough for your time. This has been so helpful. It's an enlightening conversation. Like I said, it's a topic. I mean, there's so many topics. It's hard for me to cover everything, but I know this one's really important, especially after the year we've had where a lot of law firms were afraid, right? When, when COVID yeah. started, Man, I got some real panicked calls. So you really want to be prepared. And I very much appreciate your time and your advice. Remind everyone where they can find, friend, or follow you if they want to get a hold of you and and talk bookkeeping and accounting sexy topics. Yeah, I know how I got into this. But uh, so CPN Legal is our website, cpn-legal.com. You can meet our whole staff on there and our and our office dog is on there as well. And that's um, CPN like dash. C like cat, P like Paul, and like not no. dash legal. <laughs> You're correct. You are correct. And <laughs> and I'm also on I'm also on LinkedIn and Facebook as well. 
but look forward to, to hearing from your listeners. And my objective is help. I mean, I, I seek to help first. And if I can help with a quick email, I'm happy to help. Right. You're like me. We are always happy. An, an email, yeah. a question here and there, please email, ask. We're there. We like our jobs. And I know that you, like me, love working with lawyers. So we're always willing to, to help. And I appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate you helping me out today with this episode. Thanks so much, Peggy. You're welcome. Well, thanks, everyone. Looks like we've reached the end of another great show. Make sure you find, friend, follow New Solo. Tell your friends about it. And give us a five-star reading on iTunes. It really helps. I'd love to see New Solo trending on, like, best podcast of 2021 someday soon. So <laughs> get out there and help us out. We'll see you next time. And remember, you're not alone. You're a New Solo. I've been running from nine to five. Been biting my tongue for all this time. Won't let anyone cut me short I was thinking this was the way to go and you put up your puppet show I say cheers to life cheers to me alone